Good evening, everyone. And welcome back to Uveitis uh, course, the second part. Um, uh, today with us today, uh, again, Dr. Adina Baddar, Dr. Trez Kamel, and myself, Dr. Mohamed Ablazim. Uh, we were supposed to have six presentations today, but we are postponing one of them to uh, next Thursday because of the uh, time issue. Um, we will start right away with Dr. Trez uh, Kamel with uh, anterior uveitis. Dr. Trace Kamel is a consultant ophthalmologist uh, and working in uh, Watani Hospital. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Is my voice clear? It's fine. Okay. So I'm going to start with the key points in anterior uveitis that would help you in your clinic. Let's take a few cases. Uh, first of this case, a patient who is 25 years old, he's male, uh, he comes in with unilateral redness and pain and photophobia, which is an acute attack, and visual haze. And he says this is his fourth attack, and he has one attack annually if he has any. And this has been recurrent over the past 11 years. And the federal eye actually is unremarkable. So in history taking of such cases, what you want to know about the ocular condition is when was the first attack? His first attack wasn't this one or the last one. It was 11 years back, and he has stayed quiescent for years. Then he gets the attack again. Uh, you want to know if he has the painful acute attacks or is it insidious, meaning that he noticed that he had drop of vision, but he never had the acute attacks. Is it recurrent or is it chronic, meaning does he stay off medications or does he uh, have the attacks coming back once he decreases the dose of eye drops? We need to know the frequency of attacks, meaning the pattern of attacks. Like this patient, he had an attack in 2010, 2012, 2016, and 2020. He has infrequent attacks, but they are re recurrent. And you need to know when the last attack was. Uh, was it this attack or was it one month back? Because if it was a month back, probably it's the same attack that wasn't uh, controlled uh, sufficiently. You also need to know uh, the medications he's currently using the ones he used before, and if he's using any medications, what are the doses? Meaning if the patient is coming to you with anterior uveitis and he is on topical uh, Pretford eye drops, and he's using it six or seven times daily, and he has a few cells, then you know he's just controlled and that it's not a mild type of uveitis. You need to know when last he used his medications, be it systemic or uh, topical. In examination, you need to have a proper look at the eye. For example, this patient comes in with a hypopion. If you have a patient with hypopion, you need to look at the fundus because if he has occlusive vasculitis, then this is a case of Bechet. If he has dense vitritis in the setting of hypopion, then this patient probably has endogenous endophthalmitis, and this is not a case of anterior uveitis in the first place. If the hypopion is shifting, so this is what I'm trying to say, the fundus exam. If the hypopion is shifting, then this would make you think of Bechet's more. And if it's sticky and fibrinous, like the case I was just discussing, this would take you to a different, a totally different uh, place. And also never decide it's anterior unless you've lifted the lid of the patient and made sure he doesn't have scleritis manifesting in form of mild anterior uveitis and you miss the scleritis. Or that uh, you, have, you have to also have a look at the periphery and Dr. Dina is going to cover this sufficiently. All I want to add is make sure you have a proper indentation so that you don't miss a pars planitis. And if you're ordering a fluorescein, make sure you have the, a very good look at the periphery of the of the fluorescein uh, in the late frames because you might miss perivascular leakage in the periphery thinking it's anterior uveitis. Also, if you have a patient who has anterior uveitis and he has just a cough of subretinal fluid or has cystoid edema, it doesn't mean he has a posterior uveitis. This could just occur in the setting of anterior uveitis. And if this patient has a hot disc or some mild disc edema, it also doesn't mean that this patient has posterior uveitis. This could also occur just in the setting of anterior uveitis that is severe. In review of system, let's go back to my case. This patient comes in with unilateral uh, disease, acute onset, middle-aged male patient with recurrences. The hypopion is sticky, as I discussed. And he has a history of inflammatory back pain, meaning pain that occurs more in the mornings or on staying in static position, and it's relieved when he moves around. This is inflammatory back pain, quite different from mechanical back pain, which is pain that would occur after effort. And this would take us to the spondyloarthropathy uh, group or SPA group. And sometimes these patients may have attacks in the fellow eye, meaning they flip-flop between eyes, but uh, usually one eye is the dominant eye uh, getting the more attacks. 
This family includes the ankylosing, reactive arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, and psoriatic-related arthritis. And so, as we can see, in this uh, family of diseases, you need the immunologist with you, definitely. Psoriatic arthritis may develop uh, uveitis in 7% of the cases, and uh, the uveitis may occur several years before the uh, uh, systemic manifestations. It's usually unilateral and acute, but occasionally it might be bilateral and chronic. An inflammatory bowel disease, usually Crohn's disease, would be more than ulcerative colitis in causing uveitis. Usually ulcerative colitis would cause scleritis and episcleritis. However, Crohn's may cause retinal vasculitis, pars planitis, or even orbital inflammation. Looking at this chart, you can see the prevalence of HLA-B27, anterior uveitis, and the combination of systemic diseases, anterior uveitis, and HLA-B27. And as we can see, ankylosing would be the most common having uveitis, and this would in or increase when the patient is HLA-B27 positive, followed by reactive arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, and inflammatory bowel disease would be the least. What we know from literature is 50% of these patients are HLA-B27 uh, positive. However, in Africa, the prevalence of HLA-B27 is 1% to 4%, so we cannot depend on it in diagnosing our patients. We usually diagnose them with the immunologist clinically and uh, the radiologic findings of sacroiliitis. Uh, uh, ocular treatment uh, has to be started intensely, and so I have to stress on this point. When you're managing these patients, Though the, the, the condition is painful and recurrent, they bear a good prognosis if you treat this patient intensely and promptly, meaning that you start the eye drops directly with the attack and you have to be uh, very, you have to tell your patient that once the attack starts, you have to start the eye drops. Even sometimes I tell the patients if they are, if they are intellectual enough that they have to start eye drops even before they uh, book my appointment and see me, because this is going, this is what's going to decrease the uh, risk of long-term uh, complications such as uh, posterior sinicia. You, the duration of attack is usually six weeks, so you probably will not stop the eye drops before six to eight weeks. If you stop it, the patient is going to have the attack again and the same attack that was not controlled sufficiently. Systemic treatment may be needed in severe attacks. Immunosuppressants may be ne needed just for the eye if the patient has increased rate of recurrences or the patient is chronic. And biologics has a tremendous role in uh, spondular atrophy uveitis. And sometimes, or most of the time, the immunologist is going to choose to treat this patient because of the systemic manifestation. So you just have to be aware that not all biologics would be useful for these patients. If your immunologist decides to use Emperor, this probably is not going to help the eye at all. Uh, Humira in this setting probably is the best for both the systemic manifestations and uh, for the eye. A second patient is a 45 year old. Can I ask you a question? Yes. So if, if your patient comes in, you know, one week later, their symptoms are much better. And uh, what is your experience with decreasing the drops, whether you do it or your patient, knowing that the attack is going to last for six to eight weeks? Uh, I usually wouldn't stop the drops before six weeks, even if it means uh, in the last two weeks, I'm going to give it once uh, daily or uh, day after day. So usually I would give a regimen and see the patient in two weeks. And I tell him to come back in two weeks if his um, symptoms are uh, better, but he's still on eye drops. If the patient is not improving within the first week, I tell him to come back and see me. So I would. it depends on how the patient the patient's inflammation is going to behave on the regimen I started. Okay, so I think the, the, the take-home message here is not to be very hasty with reducing drops if you are suspecting yes. or if you know that the patient has ankylosing spondylitis. Exactly. And can, I, can I ask another okay. question? Yes. Um, when do you decide to give uh, biologics? When do you decide to, to give Humira in these patients? Usually the, the, the immunologist is the one who would like to start Humira, but if the patient, if the, if the, uh, if the immunologist doesn't uh, recommend Humira for his systemic condition, because probably the immunologist thinks it's not that serious and he doesn't need it. Uh, for us, if the patient is having recurrent attacks uh, that are like four attacks annually and they're not controlled by uh, uh, methotrexate, for example, or the patient cannot tolerate methotrexate, at this point, I would start the biologics. The, the reason I'm asking you this because I've got a female uh, lady with ankylosing spondylitis, and uh, females with ankylosing spondylitis have a very low incidence of uh, systemic uh, or bone complications. So the rheumatologist would rather not give uh, biologics. And this particular patient had recurrent uh, I write so that we, we had to put her on uh, okay on Humira. Sure. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So this is right. 
that would help this patient in this setting definitely. Okay. So uh, this uh, another patient who is a 45 year old male patient coming with a very similar attack, red painful eye, and the patient says this is a second attack, but it's systemically this patient is completely free. And uh, if you look at the anterior segment of this patient, it's quite different from what I showed you. This patient has a very faint nebula, has pigmented KPs, had just one posterior cyanica, and has an area of iris atrophy with eccentric uh, pupil uh, due to uh, the area of iris atrophy. And the fair is completely normal. Interestingly, this patient comes in with unilateral, sorry, this is unilateral acute anterior uveitis. This patient has high intraocular pressure in the affected eye, though using PRET forte just to twice uh, daily. So this is a patient with hypertensive acute anterior uveitis. Sometimes these patients are confused to have to be steroid responders. But with the clinical picture I just showed you, this is a herpetic type of anterior uveitis, which could be caused by herpes simplex, zoster, or cytomegalovirus. And usually, uh, uh, ophthalmologists are reluctant to give in intense steroids because they're very concerned that the high intraocular pressure is caused from the uh, steroid eye drops. But actually, this is not the case. In this setting, once you start the steroid eye drops with the anti glucoma medications, the intraocular pressure is really going to go down. So what would make you think uh, of a patient, uh, when you say a patient that he has viral iridocyclitis? Uh, actually, uh, herpes simplex and herpes zoster give a quite a similar picture except for a few differences. And it's important to differentiate because this might kind of change your own plan of treatment. This is a herpes simplex patient. The patient may have more recurrences than the herpes zoster patient, the Chris cornea sensation, mid-dilated pupil than we would see in herpes zoster, and uh, the patients would have marginal iris uh, atrophy or sectorial iris atrophy. For herpes simplex, maybe they would run a more chronic course. Uh, the Chris cornea sensation is extremely severe. These patients have patches of iris atrophy, unlike this patient. These are two different patients, and this patient has uh, the marginal type. This one has a patchy type. Vitritis may be more common in herpes simple, uh, zoster, and uh, sometimes you might find the scars of herpes zoster on the skin, and doesn't necessarily have to be the scars on the face. It doesn't have to be herpes zoster or thalmicus. It might be lumbar or thoracic or whatever. It could be any type. Cytomegalovirus can occur uh, anteriorly in patients who are completely immunocompetent and to occur in form of coronary endothelitis, postnatal or even the chronic uh, iritis. And they have a very high incidence of recurrences. This patient would have the uh, KPs arranged in corps. Whenever you find KPs in corps, uh, giving a coin-shaped appearance, you would think of a cytomegalovirus, especially if this patient has the chronic type that would cause diffuse uh, iris atrophy like this patient, or there are large nodular uh, KPs that are usually not pigmented. Endothelitis is a very interesting type because you would diagnose it uh, directly once you place the patient on the sleep lamp usually would uh, show an area of uh, uh, KPs uh, overlaid by an area of uh, corneal edema, and it's very uh, localized. And this would resolve once you have uh, started the medications. Let's take a case. This is a 42-year-old male patient, unilateral, uh, acute attack of uh, uveitis, and it's recurrent. He has a mild uh, AC reaction and almost no redness. He has very high intraocular pressure. He has minimal cells and flare. The KPs are small and discrete and non-pigmented. And he has no posterior cyanica at all. And sometimes you might find an area of iris atrophy. And in this setting, you would think of Posner Schlossman, which is also cytomegalovirus induced. And Posner Schlossman could be associated with cytomegalovirus or herpes zoster. It would occur, it lasts for one to three weeks. The rate of recurrences is quite unpredictable. The patients could stay for a long time without treatment between attacks. And if the patient is cytomegalovirus induced Posner Schlossman, anti cytomegalovirus treatment may be useful. There are other causes of uh, hypertensive uveitis. So keep in mind toxoplasmosis, syphilis, leprosy, sarcoid, and steroid responder, even a complication of uh, uveitis due to development of peripheral anterior cyanicia. So make sure you have a proper gonioscopy exam of your patient if he has high intraocular pressure. Keep an eye on the fundus of the patient and the optic nerve evaluating by visual field and OCT uh, optic nerve when necessary. Viral iridocyclitis is, uh, if you have a serology, the question is, do we have, do, do the herpes simplex uh, uh, and zoster uh, IgGs and IgMs? Usually they're not very helpful. In AC paracentesis, uh, doing PCR is quite confirmatory, but we don't have it in Egypt, so we can't depend on it either. So uh, we have to keep the clinical picture in mind. 
we also have to know that sometimes patients can develop viral erythrocyclitis without having any form of corneal involvement whatsoever. They might have an old corneal ulcer or they might not have an ulcer at all. They might have in herpes zoster cutaneous involvement or they might not at all. And whenever you have a patient coming with viral erythrocyclitis and has high intraocular pressure with mild AC reaction, you regard this as being an acute attack because usually the trapecular meshwork is uh, in inflammation. So we do regard this as an attack and we treat this as an attack of uh, active uveitis. This is a fifth patient. This is a 25 year old female patient who comes in and she says she accidentally discovered that she had a decreased vision in one eye and she has floaters in that eye and uh, the vision is 618. The intraocular pressure is 25, which is slightly high. Never had a painful eye, never had red eye. And this would be the Fox uveitis syndrome, which was known to be caused by rubella. What we see is diffuse, discrete, non-pigmented stellate KPs with diffuse iris atrophy. They usually don't have active uh, vitritis, but they have uh, a lot of vitreous opacities. And usually they would come when the catheter has set in, and usually they would not develop posterior cyanic. And in these patients, uh, despite giving topical steroids, usually it wouldn't, uh, the KPs would remain. Heterochromia occurs in 50%, and this is why the name was changed to Fox uveitic syndrome rather than Fox heterochromic uveitis. Cataract is going to occur in 100% of the cases, and hyphema may occur during, sur during surgery because of the vessels that are in the AC, and always keep an eye on the optic nerve head. So, oh, Dr. Trix, uh, this is an uh, interesting uh, entity because I think we all do cataract, uh, and we all see cataract patients. Uh, what is your uh, what are your key points like the ones that you have right now? What are your key points in in a, in a forty five year old female coming in with posterior subcapsular cataract? How do you suspect that this might be Fuchs? I, I would suspect uh, Fuchs from the history. I would suspect uh, Fuchs from the clinical picture that I showed you in the anterior segment. The stellate KPs that never would leave by uh, giving uh, topical steroids. The very minimal uh, reaction that we might see in the AC. The appearance of the iris uh, pattern would make me suspect uh, pubes, and especially if this patient has heterochromia. Okay. Uh, uh, Dr. Dina is out. Uh, Are you still with us? Uh, I go on? She's back. Oh, you just go ahead. Yeah, I'm still okay. here. I, I just stopped the video. Okay. okay. The, the point I want to say here is that uh, what, if you're going to you have a cataract surgery for this patient, you do not have to give this patient uh, 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 pre, uh, uh, pre-operative uh, top, uh, oral steroids because th this isn't going to make a difference in keeping them quiescent after surgery, unlike all the other uveitic entities, this is an exception for that. So why do it's, I have to... Do sorry, it? excuse me, Dr. Uh, yes. I've got just an addition. When you're doing a FACO for these patients, just watch for capsule phimosis syndrome. They, they are very common okay. for capsule phimosis. Okay. So um, my my uh, advice is to do a large rexus and perhaps just do tiny uh, snips uh, to the edge of the capsule after you've finished. Okay. So we, we have to differentiate between these different types of uveitis. Though all caused by viruses is because uh, folks, as I mentioned, wouldn't respond properly to steroids. Cytomegalovirus would be treated by ancyclovirus, hyperzoster, and simplex would be treated by acyclovir. Role of systemic treatment is shortening the duration of anterior uveitis. If it's herpes simplex or zoster, we're using acyclovir or valcyclovir with the relevant doses, while cytomegalovirus will use oral valcyclovir if we need to, and uh, this would be used for six weeks. So do you think uh, there is no place for all, for topical uh, gancyclovir? No, there in is. These I actually, what I usually do is I would give my patients a month of oral steroid, oral uh, acyclovir, and I would, I always place them on gancyclovir, all of them, be they herpes simplex or zoster. Uh, we have some literature that says it helps and others that really didn't confirm, but there is a percent, I believe there is a percent uh, that can benefit from this regimen. Sometimes in these settings, we might need to place these patients on, for, on uh, antivirus for a whole year or occasionally for life, but usually patients would be very resistant to that. So whenever you think you want to do this, you just have to keep an eye on the CBC because of the neutropenia and on the renal functions. Um, 
I guess I need. Okay, this this is uh, uh, the case five, and this is a 16-year female patient who comes in with bilateral acute redness, uh, red painful eye with photophobia that occurred a month earlier. She was started on topical steroids and to get the attacks again once she tapered them. And then she got into a chronic course at a point. She had a history of joint pain for which she used oral non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. After which, two weeks later, she developed lung pain and fever. And she was thought to have urinary tract infection, so she had a urine analysis. And we can see this patient has developed some cyanica in both eyes. And uh, actually, when I saw her, she was active, though using uh, topical, steer, uh, topical steroid three times daily. So this was what I was saying about posterior uveitis and anterior uveitis. We had the fluorescein, which showed the perivascular leakage and small punctate patients in the periphery. And I looked at previous urine analysis, and I saw pus cells and minimal uh, white, uh, red blood cells and uh, with albumin in urine. At this point, she had a urine culture that came back negative. So I decided to have a beta-2 microglobulin that came back uh, slightly high. And this would make us think of an entity known as tuberculosis nephritis with uveitis, which is usually bilateral. Uh, it would usually start with fever and flank pain, sometimes with rashes, arthralgia, or weight loss. Usually, uveitis is going to occur after the occurrence of the renal problems. Uveitis occurs in 50% of these cases. It might be induced by drugs, infection, autoimmune conditions, or no precipitating condition. The renal problem might cause hypertension, proteinuria, as I mentioned, on occasionally renal failure, but usually, the renal issue is going to last for a short time and be treated by a short course of oral steroids. However, the ocular condition may be a recurrent. It's usually anterior and occasionally may be intermediate with no snowballs or snowbanks. Ultimately, these patients have good visual prognosis. Excuse me, can I, can I ask a question? Yeah. It, is this a self-limiting condition or is it an ongoing? The renal, part, the, the renal entity is self-limiting or could be treated by a short course of oral steroid. Uh, however, the ocular condition sometimes might be chronic, sometimes will be anterior or sometimes may be posterior intermediate like this case. And, and at that point, you, would you treat it topically or? Is you, no, no, we actually we well. systemic treatment. Yeah, so this patient had systemic treatment. And we can see the picture in the middle montage is after the vasculitis had resolved. And likewise, the fellow eye. And this was when she was active and the, the montage was when it resolved. So in senior, all you need to ask for is a urine analysis and a blood test. The urine analysis, you have to write beta-2 microglobulin in urine. What, what other findings you find in the urine is low-grade proteinuria, xenophilia, mild pyuria like this patient. This is not a urinary tract infection and trace hematuria. And the most important part is sometimes you might find glucose in urine while this patient is normal glycemic. As for the blood test, check for anemia, xenophilia, slightly high uh, karyat or very high karyat, slightly high liver enzymes and ESR. So all you need to ask for actually is renal uh, urine analysis, CBC, liver functions, renal functions, and blood glucose to make sure that this patient is normal glycemic. Definitely a renal biopsy would be definitive, but not all nephrologists prefer to have this procedure. If you have a nice looking lady coming to your uh, clinic with uveitis and this is her first attack, just ask if she had a laser hair removal of the brow or the face. And uh, usually uh, sometimes the patients would have an attack that would last an average of two to six weeks that would be treated by topical steroids and wouldn't reoccur again. Or if you have an old lady that has come with the first attack of bilateral acute granulomatous anterior uveitis, after excluding masquerades, or before excluding masquerades, you have to ask if this patient has had uh, biphosphines, which is a type of uh, medication used for osteoporotic uh, patients who are in the geriatric age group. And so we have the entity of drug-induced uveitis, and drug-induced uveitis would be systemic uh, drugs or topical. Systemic drugs would include antivirals, biphosphines, and sulfolamides, while the topicals would include anti medications or moxifloxacine, uh, eye drops, which we commonly use, especially if the patient is going to have a surgery. Topical steroid uh, is going to uh, very helpful in this setting and sometimes need to stop the eye drops. Masquerade will be covered by, by Dr. Dina next visit, but uh, next uh, session. Uh, but uh, I want to uh, make, a, I just want to highlight that occasionally a patient would have a trauma that you would think uh, did, or didn't penetrate anywhere in the eye and the eye is completely normal. But if you have a bone, you might find an uh, intraocular foreign body in the angle. Uh, leukemia is one of the types of uveitis that would occur in form of pseudo-hypopion, sometimes uh, blood-tinged hypopion. 
uh, you might find nodular iris infiltrates, uh, hyphema, vitritis, or corridor infiltrates, and the, the hypopian usually has a very characteristic, what we call lumpy, bumpy appearance, and usually they don't respond to steroid and don't have steroid sinicia. You had AC paracentesis. We diagnose it, the most common is the acute lymphocytic leukemia. This patient came to me, and he's a male patient <clears throat> who is 65 years old. And uh, he had this very awkward lesion in the anterior chamber. So we had we decided to have an AC wash and send it for cytology and culture. And what came back was that he had this very weird cryptococcal uh, fungal infection, which is quite resistant to treatment. And actually, it occurred after it was removed or washed out. And this is my uh, poll question. Now, we have a 55-year-old female patient. She had right cataract surgery two months earlier. She's had hazy vision since then. Sometimes her eyes go red since the day of surgery, and she didn't have any visual improvement. She would use topical steroids that would show partial improvement. Her vision was 660, and her intraocular pressure was slightly high. So what would you uh, do next? Uh, what would be the investigation that you would prefer to do? This patient had pigmented capes, and she had a lot of pigmented cells in the anterior chamber floating. So what would be the... Um, the investigation that you would go for in this case. Okay, can we have the answers? Okay, they're still voting, so. Okay. Here you go, can you see it? No. They uh, they said uh, AC tab for culture twenty five percent for cytology seventeen percent UBM twenty mm -hmm. nine percent and ocular ultrasound twenty nine percent. It's nothing uh, conclusive. Okay, this patient had a, a UBM and okay, that's the that's the result. Yeah, so right. so the, the UBM the UBM actually showed that this patient had a. a malpositioned, uh, decentered uh, anterior chamber, uh, chamber IOL that was causing uh, friction with the iris. And this was what caused the pigmented KPs and the, the pigmented cells in the anterior chamber. And in conclusion, sorry, I guess I'm time out. Uh, do not rush to the diagnosis of anterior uveitis. Proper history taking, examination, and review system is very important, and always be minded of masquerades. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Kamel. Uh, I would like to ask you at the end, uh, there is an entity of anterior uh, uveitis, or, uh, recurrent acute iritis of no cause, it's idiopathic. Uh, we, we tend to treat just with topical treatment, and we just do systemic inquiry to the patient and advise the patient whenever uh, he gets the symptoms again that he should rush to the doctor and to start a course of uh, topical steroids and dilating drops. Is that your practice as well? If, the, if, if it's, uh, the, the recurrences are not so severe, I mean, the patient always just has one plus cells and this is where we're going and coming from. But if the patient usually, if the patient would spike to two plus cells, I would be concerned to have a uh, fluorescein and look at the periphery of the fundus properly, or probably this patient has an entity of vasculitis. So if the patient doesn't have any of this and the patient is one plus in the attacks, I, I can, if I can keep the patient quiescent on twice daily steroid eye drops, trying to taper them to once daily or day after day, yes, I would go on without systemic medication. Okay. Um, now we're waiting for Dr. Adina. I'm not sure where. Oh, here you are. I'm here. I'm here. Uh, She's here. Okay, so um, now I'm, um, I'm. I have the privilege to to present Dr. Adina Badar. She's a consultant ophthalmologist uh, in um, the Research Institute of Ophthalmology. She also is working in Watani Hospital. She's going to give us a, a review of uh, intermediate uveitis. Thank you, uh, Dr. Teresa. I'm going to start sharing my screen. Yes. Stop sharing. Thank you. You're not managing? I can't share. Oh, now I can. Okay. All right. Okay. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Yes. 
All right. So I'm going to talk about intermediate uveitis, which we see not very commonly, but we do see it in our uh, practice. Please stop me if you have any questions. So my question, there are a few uh, um, questions that we're going to tackle. That first thing, what is exactly is intermediate uveitis? Because this is the uh, less um, common and less uh, distinct uh, entity of, of the abilities, the clinical presentations, the possible etiologies and common associations, and the treatment of isolated ocular intermediate uveitis. So what is intermediate uveitis? It's basically an inflammation in this part of the eye. So it, it used to be called highlighters. It's still sometimes because it's, it's an extra inflammation of the hyaloid. It's an inflammation of the part of the eye that we don't see all that much, which is basically the pars plana and the peripheral retina. So we, we, you might not be able to see, but trust me, they speak for themselves. Those, this is this is what you see the, the floating opacities in the vitreous. This is exactly what you see in intermediate uveitis. So we we spoke about that in our last um, in, in in the lecture last week, but I'm going to stress upon it again. What is anterior uveitis? Anterior uveitis is any inflammation that primarily affects the anterior segment of the eye, which is basically the anterior chamber and the the stereo body in plus or minus cells behind the lens. This is all within the anterior uh, uveitis. Now we come to intermediate uveitis, which is basically this part of the eye until we reach the back of the eye, which is the posterior uveitis. Posterior uveitis include the, uh, the retinal vasculitis, the retinitis, and the choroiditis. And then you have panuveitis, which is basically an inflammation in the retina with cells in the vitreous and the AC. Again, so what is not intermediate, what is not intermediate uveitis? These are all examples of posterior uveitis, like we, we were saying, you know, this is choroiditis, this is chorioretinitis, and this is serpiginous, this is toxo, this is retinitis, this is CMV retinitis, and this is vasculitis, patient's vasculitis. So all of these entities, if they have inflammatory cells in the AC or the vitus, they're called panuveitis. Why do we need this distinction? Because once you have this distinction, in your head, you're going to be able to classify the patient better, at least again, like we said, uh, in the first one or two visits. Once you classify the patient, when you, once you know exactly what you're dealing with, or basically what you know, you have like two or three differentials in your mind, then things are going to get clearer as you go. Again, what are the causes? Because when you say a lot of the patients that are referred to the clinic, to the uh, uveitis clinic as having intermediate uveitis are actually pan -uveitis. And when you say pan the, the the differential is very narrow. The, these are the differential of the pan -uveitis. So that's why the, the intermediate uveitis, it pans out more. So what is intermediate uveitis? It's, it's, it's basically haze, it's highlighters. It's an inflammation of the collagen inside the eye, the, inside the vitreous. So this is what haze is. Mind you, a lot of the terms that we use in medicine were, 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 were coined abroad. They were not coined in our region. We practice in Egypt. They were not coined in Egypt. They were coined abroad. So a lot of the things that we're going to say today are uh, related to life abroad. So the, what is exactly highlights? It's, it's like haze. It's like what, we, what you see in the morning. Alayaf Masr al-Shabura. This is what haze is. So basically, when you're trying to look at the at the fundus, but you can't focus. You can't focus on the vessels. You can't focus on the disc. In the absence, of course, of media opacity, like uh, sorry, in the absence of cataract, this is how you identify that the patient has intermediate uveitis. The, the this this is the anatomic criteria of uveitis. Like we were saying, this anterior intermediate was formerly known hyalitis or basal retinochoroiditis. And then the posterior uveitis, like we said, is a focal, multifocal, choroiditis, choroiditis, retinochoroiditis, neurovic. Everything in this entity is posterior. And then you have the pan uveitis, like we were saying. So the, the what do you expect to see in intermediate uveitis? So first of all, you see the haze. You see the vitreous being um, turbaned. And you see what the, what is called snowballs. Now, I took this picture especially for you guys. This is snow in a ball in my head. They really look like cotton in my hand, sorry. They, they really look like cotton. These are snowballs. It's like, you know how the snowballs, the shaker snowballs? It's exactly like that. And the more, when you move it, the eye, 
they move with you. So the snowballs are usually in the periphery. They're usually down there. So you have to get the patient to look down. And like Dr. Therese was just saying, you know, you need to look for, you know, you, you need to look for the signs. So it's either you do good indentation or you use a contact lens. I usually use a contact lens. That's okay. You use a contact lens and look at the inferior, very, very inferior peripheral retina. And you see what, we, what is called snow banking. Now, what, what is snow banking? Again, another picture <clears throat> of snow. So when, when snow settles on the ground, you know, you, you shovel an area and then you push it to the side and this is what snow makes. It just stays on the side of things. That's exactly what inflammation does. It stays on the side on the on the side of the retina of the of the of the eye wall. You know, this is this is all inflammation. Okay. Now how to grade haze? This is this is what I was trying to say. It's it's turbidity. Okay. So uh, this is how uh, it's graded and it's still, it's an, it's an old grading system, 1984, 85, but still works. And they were judging by the posterior pole clarity. Now I don't do the posterior pole clarity. I do the optic nerve head clarity. So I examine the patient, I look at the optic nerve head and I grade my haze. Uh, this, is, this is exactly what haze looks like. Turbidity is like looking through clear water and then less clear water. Another way to grade the haze is by using fundus camera. Uh, if the patient dilates well, you can use the fundus camera to grade the haze and to document the haze. Like Dr. Trees was just saying, you know, how you document and look at the optic nerve whenever possible. Same goes for haze. Now, clinical presentation. So basically the patient either looks quiet on the inside of the eye, you know, some redness on the outside of the eye, the outside of the eye looks quiet, or patient has inflammation, posterior synechia, some cataract, plus or minus anterior segment inflammation. This is the classic, classic. It's more, the, the more common uh, presentation that we see in our clinics, and I would like to hear uh, Dr. Kamal and Dr. Abdelazim um, experience on that. What is usually the presenting uh, symptom in intermediate uveitis patients in your practice? The commonest is uh, floaters. Most of the patients just come with floaters. If you have How a well? red eye, then probably a cyanechia, but probably there's an associated disease like sarcoidosis as well. Okay, and Dr. Therese, how, how yeah, often do you... The question is how often, what's the most uh, common presentation? Yes. Uh, yeah. Usually the haze and floaters. The patients would say they, they have hazy vision more in the mornings and the floaters. Yeah. So I have a slightly different experience. I see a lot of cataract in intermediate vets and I don't okay. know if you guys, do you guys agree? Do you see cataracts in intermediate vets? Uh, not, not, uh, not that often. Yeah. Probably secondary I, I, to, yeah. They develop along the way. Yeah. 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 So it's one of those, it's one of those disease entities in which you look out for a cataract quite often. So it's either in, uh, induced by inflammation or induced by treatment. Uh, and this is more often what I see, right? More often than not, you get posterior synechia, limited view of the back of the eye, and plenty of cataracts. You know, sometimes this is, this is a membrane, but sometimes there's also lens opacity behind it. The other presentation is disc edema. Sometimes you get a patient with disc edema, and when you do fluorescein angiogram, you can appreciate the amount of leakage from the disc and the vessels with some with or, with or without cystoid macular edema. So this is only the posterior pole. What about looking at the periphery? Like Dr. Trace was just saying, now always look at your periphery. You, you just cannot examine a patient, regardless of it being anterior, intermediate, or posterior uveitis, without looking at the periphery and acquiring a fluorescein if you suspect something is happening at the back of the eye. Now, this is what you see with intermediate uveitis. This is not the primary vasculitis. This is only a vasculitis that is secondary to the amount of inflammation that is happening in the hyaloid, in the in the in the in the, in the uh, vitreous cavity. Okay, uh, so this is what we call the ferning pattern on pattern on FA. Basically, so you have the large vessels, and then you have the branching vessels, and the small capillaries. They start to there because of the inflammation. They ooze the fluid. They ooze their their fluid, and they ooze their the 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 dye, and that's what, what, what is called fern. This is a, a type of, of, um, of plant. 
Okay, so here's an example of a 16-year-old single-eyed patient. Sometimes, sadly, sometimes by the time those patients uh, present to you, this is 16-year-old that was single-eyed. We did a B scan of the other eye, and she had cerebral body detachment. Sometimes the inflammation, uh, the patient, um, the inflammation is so much, it's so strong, the, and the, the membranes that are uh, formed around the cerebral body are so strong that the cerebral body detaches. And this is what, you know, with the limited view of the back of the eye, we can see the ferning pattern in this is superior, inferiorly, and then in late frames, you can appreciate the amount of um, uh, inflammation in the posterior pole and the disc. This is the, so when you do um, uh, um, an OCT through the macula, macula looks okay. Yes, there's a uh, spongy edema, but I mean, an acceptable amount, not that I would worry me. But the disc is extremely edematous. And when we did OCT and geography on the disc, the patient had new vessels. Okay, this patient is under treatment and the new vessels, they regress. The other thing that the patient presents with is sometimes uh, systolic macular edema. Sometimes the presenting symptom is um, inflammation of the, of the middle part of the eye, not so much, but they have significant systolic macular edema. Um, okay, now let's talk about common associations and let have a, let's have a poll question. Uh, Dr. Abdelazim, can we have the question? The following diseases are associated with intermediate uveitis except sympathetic ophthalmia, sarcoid, multiple sclerosis, or Crohn's disease. We have the uh, most, yeah, most chose uh, Crohn's disease, uh, the yes. correct. All right, so uh -huh. it's an interesting uh, result. Okay, so it's not very common in IBD, but uh, sympathetic ophthalmia is a choroiditis primarily. So you do get uh, haze in the anterior, in the in the in the vitreous. But sympathetic ophthalmia is a choroiditis, like pretty much like BKH. Okay, so what are the causes of intermediate event? The most common, the most common in distribution by far is the idiopathic uh, type. And it's now known, you know, it's more acceptable now in literature to call this, pars, to call it pars planitis. So when, if you're talking, uh, if you're, you know, referring a patient as being pars planitis, you mean that you've looked at the systemic manifestations and couldn't elicit any positive uh, associated disease. That's why we call the, pa the patient, um, uh, we, we brand the patient as having pars planitis. Now, TB is quite common in Egypt. Whether you decide to get a, TB, a PPD test or a quantiferon, remember that the, there's a significant difference in um uh, cost. So uh, if your patient um, uh, has limited, um, you know, financial resources, you're okay to go with tuberculin skin test and actually get a tuberculin skin test on almost all uveitis patients that you see. Now, sarcoidosis, if you're suspecting sarcoidosis, if you see uh, any disc uh, edema or disc pallor, if the patient gives any history of uh, chest issues or joint issues, go uh, do acquire an angi angiotensin converting enzy enzyme and a high resolution CT chest. Now, MS is, is, is associated with uh, vasculitis in the back of the eye, especially inferiorly. And sometimes the patient presents with this type of vasculitis and then later they develop MS. So keep, uh, keep the MS in the back of your mind. You're okay to get an MRI, MRI brain, especially if the, if the woman, because it's usually a woman, if the woman has any uh, suggestive history of MS. Now, Bechet's disease, you know it from symptoms. Bechet's disease is a clinical diagnosis, primarily a clinical diagnosis. Fuxi syndrome, like Dr. Chase was just saying, because the primary is, uh, presenting symptom is floaters, which is exactly like intermediate uveitis. Primary intraocular lymphoma is one of the more important masquerades, and we will talk about that um, in the next um, time that we meet next Thursday. But it, it should be in the back of your mind with intermediate uveitis in the in the in the older age, so 60 and above. And Crohn's disease, yes, it's it's common. Uh, yes, it's less common, but it happens that you get um, 
Crohn's disease associated intermediate uveitis or anterior uveitis and uh, the, you usually identify the symptoms and you get a calprotectin in stools. If you're very, very, very uh, suspicious, you can refer the patient to get a colonoscopy. Now, the more important, the, 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 the more distinctive thing about idiopathic uh, intermediate uveitis also is that it's binodal. So you get before the age of 20, it's quite high. And then you see from age of 20 to 40, usually female now, that's where MS really rises above in incidence. And then, uh, and then between 40 and 60, you get another surge with infections. Uh, this is taken from a, a tertiary care center in Germany. And this is the distribution of patients uh, with intermediate events that they see. 60% uh, that are idiopathic, 20% showed MS, 10% sarcoid, 4% uh, infections. And in Egypt, the infection would be TB, 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 until proved otherwise. The miscellaneous, they, they uh, included uh, drug toxicity, like Dr. Hughes was just saying, and uh, Crohn's. Okay, so I'm going to discuss the treatment of isolated ocular disease in intermediate uveitis because if we go back to this um, list, if you have, you, we, we discussed the 60% of the patients are isolated ocular, right? If the patient is TB positive, you, you refer to chest. If the patient has sarcoidosis, please refer to chest or immunology. If the patient has MS, please, please refer to neurology. If the patient has Bechet's immunology and, and so on, IBD, tropical disease. So always have somebody on call. But if the patient is idiopathic, then we have a step ladder approach. We usually um, start with the, 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 the classic immunomodulatory therapy here means steroids, 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 steroids. For, for, which is the same for intermediate. So what, hap what, what occurs for uveitis basically occurs for uh, intermediate uveitis. We start with steroids, they are in the back of our heads, and then we we think about, nobody, yeah, very few people have, use now uh, prefer retinal cryopexy because we have much um, better regional steroids. And then you go to immunomodulatory, you can go to uh, immunomodulatory therapy and biologics. Also, uh, pars planar vitrectomy is very much on the table in intermediate uveitis. See? Parasplanar vitrectomy is very much on the table. So intermediate, this is my scheme. Okay, first of all, I try to identify the underlying cause. And then I, I think about systemic therapy. If there's a systemic disease identified, if the disease is bilateral, or if there's failed response to local therapy. But I would say that my first and foremost um, treatment option is local therapy, especially in unilateral disease in uh, treatment of complications, uh, for treatment of complications and uh, in incomplete response to systemic therapy. Sometimes patient is in systemic therapy and one eye is more inflamed than the, neck, than the other eye. And so I top up the patient with um, uh, regional steroids. Uh, my question to uh, Dr. Um, Dr. Abdul Azim, um, how often do you do um, preocular steroids and do you do them in your in the surgery ward or uh, in your clinic? I often use it especially in uh, pars planitis, uh, which means idiopathic intermediate uveitis, particularly if it's unilateral. If it's bilateral, I would go with systemic uh, immunosuppression. Um, I, I just inject in the office. Uh, I do it in an orbital floor. It's like uh, giving a local anesthetic. Just give it an orbital floor injection rather than uh, posterior subtenin uh, with uh, with an insulin uh, syringe. I think this is the way you do it. <laughs> yes, that's how I do it. Now we'll discuss yeah. that. These are the yeah. three main uh, um, ways of giving regional steroids. The nozic technique, which is yeah. uh, I'm going to discuss, which I'm going to discuss, the blunt cannula, which I sometimes use, especially in young uh, kids that I can't give uh, the steroids to. Uh, so I do it under anesthesia in the operating theater and the orbital floor. And I believe, believe this is your favorite, Dr. Ablazim. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Teresa, how, um, what's your favorite technique? But actually, I, I also use the orbital floor technique. All right, okay. So, uh, so I so we agreed that we use regional steroids more often in intermediate uveitis than not. 
especially if the patient has a CME or a badly behaving eye. So whether a unilateral disease or a starkly um, or a stark discrepancy between both eyes under systemic treatment. Uh, there's always, 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 always the intravitreal steroids, which uh, you can use in vitritis and in CME refractory to preoccur injections and second line immunosuppressive therapy. If your patient has been on therapy, they're not showing the response that you expect, it's okay to give um, intravitreal steroids. So if, if I'm going to do the treatment in clinic, this is how I prep. Okay, so we have uh, topical uh, um, anesthetic. This is the drug. This is the uh, uh, an insulin syringe and a three or a five uh, centimeter syringe and a Q-tip. Okay, so I soak the Q-tip in in uh, in the topical anesthetic and I place it under the eyelid. Mind you, the patient should not close their eyes. If they close their eyes, they get you get the bells and it's going to you're going to injure the cornea uh, under with the Q-tip. And then I take the Q-tip out. I do. I, I stabilize uh, my hands. Like mind you, you always have to stabilize your hands with uh, with your fingers on the patient. Okay. And I start above the 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 temp the lateral canthus. I start above, and then I roll my hands behind the 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 globe. This is how I learned it from Dr. Goldstein, my mentor. You roll your hands behind the globe and you start injecting. You first um, uh, take out some uh, fluid just to make sure that you're not um, intravascular and then you start injecting. This is how I, I roll the hands. I, I, I keep rolling the eye downwards and rolling my hand upwards such that I'm hooking the upper lid uh, under the, uh, over my, uh, my knee. In surgery, I use this uh, blunt cannula that I got for, particularly for this purpose. So you prep the patient, you um, like you're going to do surgery, but it's not an actual surgery, but you open the cons. So you open the conjunctiva, okay, like a snip of the conjunctiva. You introduce the blunt cannula. Of course, you expect a few, you know, traces of blood here and there. You, you introduce the cannula. In, uh, behind the, it's a blunt cannula, so don't be afraid. You introduce it behind the eye globe and you inject. And then I, I just check to see the that the medicine is placed well under the conjunctiva. I don't, of course, don't suture the conjunctiva. I leave it and it heals nicely. So these are my take-home points. In intermediate uveitis is uh, an inflammation in the in the vitreous with no retinal lesion. The patient can present with a, with a complication. So patient can, the, the first presenting symptom can be cystoid macular edema or cataract. There, you expect an inter-eye discrepancy. You expect that one patient might be, one eye might behave dif differently than the other. You expect to find an underlying etiology in 40% of the cases or less, but in 68%, like we saw in Germany, sometimes it, the patient is idiopathic and consider local therapy for uh, one eye disease. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you, Dr. Adina. I would like to ask you, is it in your uh, experience that uh, intermediate uveitis of no cause, idiopathic intermediate uveitis, uh, often has a self-limiting course? <laughs> I would this, like is, this is my experience. This is my experience. I, I've yeah. got like uh, seven, seven out of 10 have a limited course. And if it's not a limited course, then probably there is a systemic underlying problem. Um, I, I, I really think it's one of the better behaving uveitis yeah. entities. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, it's, yeah. Just, um, it's just that sometimes with kids, sometimes they respond really well and sometimes they don't. And especially with kids, you know, like keeping them on, you know, heavy medication, especially that all they suffer from is some floaters. Sometimes the patient sees really well. They, they see 0.7 or so. They all they suffer from floaters. But once you look in, looking down there, you see how much inflammation that they have. And the haze is increasing uh, towards the, the, um, the base of the retina. Um, so it's very hard to keep them under medications, but um, I've had okay experience. Yeah. Just that sometimes I keep them on medication until I do the, uh, you do your cataract surgery too. 
I had uh, two uh, questions. Uh, have you ever come across a setting where the patient has very dense anterior uveitis that's totally cataract? And then when you start the medication, when the cells are so dense and they're stuck to the back of the lens, and then you think it's cataract or you would sense you like it's cataract, and when you start the medications, it clears off. Be clear. Yeah, I've had this. I've had something pretty similar to what you're exp explaining in a TB patient, in which I I only put her on anti TB medication. I didn't need to use steroids. Um, I had thought the referring surgeon had thought that we were going are going to use cat. You know, going to for the cataract surgery. Yeah. So it, okay. It's okay, very so often that you have a, a posterior sinusia, so it's very difficult to evaluate the cataract. So uh, sometimes, yeah. And you you get surprised that the patient is uh, has an improvement of vision because the vitritis is improved. Whereas I would yeah. evaluate it, he has a cataract. Behind the so I had a question, another question. You were, you were talking of uh, biologics and immunomodulators. So would you be concerned, uh, or how would you evaluate that the patient is not an MS patient or potentially an MS patient before? I mean, would you do, do anything differently in this setting? Because that's, we don't want to place MS patients on biologics. That's a, that's a very good question. That's a very good question. So, uh, uh, we need to 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 point out to the to the audience that uh, biologics uh, um, have been found to precipitate uh, MS demyelination attacks in in prone patients in MS patients. So, Dr. Thies's question is spot on. In intermediate uveitis, you have to have a very high level of suspicion that this could be MS and uh, use the TNF inhibitors sparingly. And unlike Bech's patients, where you you're re ready and happy to put the patient on TNF inhibitors with intermediate uveitis of unknown cause or otherwise undifferentiated, expected to become MS at some point, you have to be very, very cautious. So your question is very valid. If the patient is, you know, in the childbearing period, especially a female, um, I would do a, an MRI and get an ANA before I put the patient on biologics. Right. I, of course, I don't do biologics on my own. I do yeah. it under... Yeah. In case you're suspecting MS, then which systemic uh, immunosuppressant rather than steroids they use? Because again, some immunosuppressants are not uh, very compatible with MS. I mean, uh, cyclosporin, for instance, is not the best choice for for, uh, for MS. Rather, azathioprine is or or uh, mycophilate mufetil, the salicept, uh, is a better choice. So that's a, that's a good question. I have one intermediate UVS patient in which I'm highly suspecting her to be MS and for the time being, I'm keeping her on regional um, steroids and I'm really holding my hand towards any systemic medications in those patients. And if I were to start any medication, I would take an opinion of an immunologist and a neurologist before I, even, uh, if, it's, it's safe, uh, even if it's methotrexate, which is safe. It's, it's pretty safe to, to give cell set. Uh, and as a thyroprene in these patients, even the if it's MS. Sometimes the patients are in this, you know, critical childbearing period. So between their the MS, between their eye and between them wanting to have children, sometimes you're really stuck. You're really well, stuck. Actually, actually, surprisingly, as a thyroprene was found to be safe during pregnancy. Very, uh, very weird. And, and, yeah. and cyclosporin as well. Neural, yeah. Cyclosporin. Yeah. 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 Cyclosporin is more. Yeah. yeah. Like I didn't know that. Very enriching discussion. Thanks. <laughs> okay. So I think it's my turn. Um, now I'm going to present a, um, So we have a question uh, from the from the audience uh, that they're not very comfortable about going blindly behind the globe. Uh, I would agree with you, uh, the doctor who was asking the question. Sometimes, uh, you, you, like I would not recommend doing it unless you're very very sure because you can risk globe perforation. Um, don't do it if you're not sure. Yes, you can do it under the, in the anterior, not the end. Yeah, in the subtenon space. Or if you're not happy, then do the orbital floor technique. It's pretty safe because you push the globe with your uh, with your finger. Another question: Do you use orthodex implants? Yes, orthodex implants can be used. Um, uh, you can. I don't have a personal experience, but yes, they're used, and 
uh, the reticert implants abroad are used to. Which they stopped they stopped making the reticert, but they were used. Okay, yeah, we'll now start they now with the uh, sorry. Yeah, I want to just add that they use the Libyan that lasts for about two years uh, rather than the reticert. Yeah. Uh, and is it fluoromethalone as well? Uh, it, no, it, it's a DEXA. I believe it's a dexamethasone. Dexamethasone, as same as those are dex, but, but slowly releasing. It's released over a very long period of time. Okay. So uh, the next presentation is neuro um, we, We're all familiar with Bechet's disease. It's, it's the, probably the most common uh, uveitis here in Egypt and the Middle East. Um, so what I'm trying to, to point from this presentation that the, the cause of uh, visual symptoms uh, sometimes is not due to the uveitis um, uh, in, in basic. Rather, it's because of the affection of the central nervous system. So Bech's disease being a systemic vasculitis, it can cause uh, vasculitis in the brain as well. So, uh, and as, as well as peripheral neuropathy. With the CNS uh, involvement, there's parenchymal involvement and non-parenchymal involvement. Parenchymal means cerebral vasculitis. So if there is an inflammation of, uh, of, uh, of the cortex at the uh, visual cortex, for instance, the patient will come complaining of visual disturbance. Non-parenchymal involvement, it can um, very, very often, basic can present with dural sinus thrombosis or very rarely arterial occlusion or aneurysm. So here is an, uh, an example of the white signals, as you can see in the uh, uh, brain matter, uh, indicating uh, uh, cerebral vasculitis. Here, uh, the arrow is pointing to irregular filling of straight uh, uh, sinus because of thrombosis, so uh, venous sinus thrombosis. Here is a non-filling on the venogram. Again, this is an arteriogram showing an aneurysm and uh, a, a, a dropout, a, a non-filling. Uh, this is extremely rare. So what I'm going to do is, is present cases which actually came to my clinic uh, with all these uh, varieties. The, this is a 25-year-old engineer who presented to my clinic in 2007 with a two-year history of poor vision in the more in the right eye. He was complaining of a severe headache, a constant severe headache. Before he came to me, he had several MRIs showing brain vasculitis, um, but never uh, associated with the, or, or a relation was made with the visual symptoms that he had. He received several doses of methylprednisone with temporary improvement. He was given a wrong diagnosis of uveitis elsewhere and given local steroids, uh, he was then put on uh, pulse steroids and cyclophosphamide with no uh, good improvement. His visual acuity at that point was counting fingers in the right eye, 624 minus in the left eye. The rest of the examination was completely normal. This is the fluorescein angiogram he came with. And as you can see, it's pretty normal. He had the visual uh, field done. The, uh, the uh, left eye was the only one uh, uh, obtainable. Because of the poor vision in the right eye, they, they would be able to do a visual field test. So I did that with confrontation. As you can see, it's an almost uh, uh, hemianopia. It's uh, uh, respecting the vertical line. So it's a neurological cause of uh, visual impairment. Uh, the, the brain MRI showing uh, vasculitis at the, cerebr the visual cortex um, described as inflammation at the corona radiata, which is basically the optical radiation. Um, I decided to put him in Remicade, which was uh, still a new drug at that point, and uh, he immediately had a, a very good uh, recovery, and the visual acuity uh, climbed to 624 in the right and 618 plus uh, in the left, with a marked improvement in his, in his visual uh, field. Um, this is the visual field obtained by confrontation on the left, and that's obtained by uh, testing on the right. You see uh, a marked improvement, and the left side, the same thing. So he was completely rehabilitated and returned back to his job as an engineer. Uh, he was maintained later on a two-monthly Remicade 
in the steroids 10 milligrams well as methotrexate 10 milligrams per week. Um, the uh, second uh, uh, model or example is venous sinus thrombosis causing intracranial hypertension. The first patient uh, came uh, to me in 2009, uh, a 22 year old uh, student, male student, with a two uh, months history of headache and diplopia of acute onset. Um, uh, he uh, gave a history of uh, papilledema and that he had lumbar punctures uh, with uh, very high opening pressure. So he was diagnosed as the intracranial hypertension. Um, he also is a hypermetrope and is known to be ambidiope. Um, he's uh, diagnosed elsewhere as uh, basic. He has the full uh, uh, features of recurrent mouth genital ulcers as well as uh, superficial thrombophlebitis. He was given several doses of systemic steroid. This is his appearance um, when he presented to me with the right esotropia. On examination, his vision is 618 in the right, 612 in the left. The uh, anterior segment was pretty normal. Uh, fundus was, was again, um, the only feature is established papilledema, bilateral established papilledema. And he had a right sixth nerve palsy. This is his fundus appearance. This is his visual field. MRI, pretty normal. So what was the relation? What is the relation between papilledema and Bech's disease? Is it coincidental? This is what they thought, that it's just a, it happened by chance, it's double pathology. Idiopathic intracranial hypertension and was therefore treated with diuretics and repeated lumbar punctures, a steroid. However, uh, he, uh, he got uh, uh, very short periods of improvement and relapsed later on. He was being scheduled for bilateral optic nerve sheath decompression uh, when he uh, presented to my clinic. Um, at that time, there was a, a paper, a very important paper that came out in ophthalmology that uh, patients presenting with idiopathic intracranial hypertension, 10% or more of them, if they had an MRV, they uh, were discovered to have a venous sinus thrombosis as the cause of their intracranial hypertension. And uh, this is important because uh, these patients would, would require anticoagulants to, to, uh, to cure. Uh, in our patient, there is an incomplete filling of the sagittal sinus by, uh, by MRV, and the diagnosis is made. Once the diagnosis is made, the patient was put on anticoagulants, aiming at an INR of less than three. He was started on uh, Remicade, azathioprine, and uh, steroids in addition to the Lasix to uh, control his intracranial pressure. Only a few weeks later, his headache started to resolve. On this exam revealed complete resolution of papilledema. Visual field testing revealed no further deterioration. And MRV was repeated reporting resolution of his venous thrombosis. This is his uh, before and after visual field. The, uh, the uh, surprise is that his visual acuity has improved to 6-9 bilaterally. And uh, this was a mystery to me because increasing cranial pressure was, is not uh, normally associated with reduced pressure. And relieving the pressure does not necessarily improve this uh, vision. But uh, I came across several papers reporting such an incident. If, the, if you have a very sudden rise of intraocular pressure, of intracranial pressure, you can, you can have a, a reduced uh, vision because of uh, brain edema or um, optic nerve edema. Uh, the patient also had a complete resolution of a sixth nerve palsy. Well, until the last uh, follow-up, which was years ago, he maintained convalescence and rehabilitation on two monthly Remicade and Imuran 50 milligram twice per day. This is before and after. You can see his sixth nerve palsy has completely resolved. The uh, next patient of the same uh, category is a 90 uh, is a 29 year old male uh, patient known patient patient who presented to me in uh, 2014 with blurred vision left more than right with severe headache lumbar puncture was done with a very high opening pressure however no cells or growth uh, mri and mra were free mrv uh, showed an occluded extracranial dural sinus uh, the rest of the investigations were normal Visual acuity, 6-9 in the right, no PL in the left. Fundus examination, at bilateral markedly elevated discs with hemorrhages. 
left uh, optic disc was choked, very, very uh, highly elevated with completely white, very empty vessels and um, no vision in this eye. As you can see, a complete non-filling of one of the uh, uh, sinuses, venous sinuses. And this is the good eye, the right eye showing uh, marked papilledema and uh, peripapillary hemorrhages. Uh, later, uh, the edema started to resolve after starting uh, Clixan and Merivan, uh, as well as cyclophosphamide and Sidamex. Um, um, he also had repeated lumbar punctures to try to control his uh, intracranial pressure. Uh, later, I changed the, the regimen from cyclophosphamide, which I, I personally don't think is very effective in these cases to cyclosporin 200 milligrams uh, and maintained his anticoagulants. In his last visit uh, a couple of years ago, his uh, papilledema is completely resolved and remained uh, normal with a 6-6 vision. He's currently on cyclosporin 200 milligrams and steroids 10 milligrams. Our last uh, patient in the last category, which is very rare, uh, arterial complications, including aneurysm. This is a young fit male uh, who just walk, just one day he went into coma in 2006. He was rushed to the hospital, did a CT, a brain CT scan, which uh, revealed intracranial hemorrhage uh, due to a ruptured aneurysm. Uh, he had a titanium clip to close his uh, aneurysm and recovered uh, very nicely with no residue. At that point, he had a, a routine uh, uh, examination, uh, ophthalmic examination. His vision is 6'6". And slightly swallowed this, but they were not sure, so they decided it's normal. This is his uh, hemorrhage with uh, ruptured uh, aneurysm. This is the titanium clip in place. Three years later, in 2009, he represented with reduced vision, very gradual reduction of vision. He uh, was then 612 in both eyes. From this examination, revealed very clear disc and macular edema. So, what's the cause? What's the relation? This is the the OCT, um, the uh, old days with a poor resolution. However, it's showing very nicely that there is a serious detachment and cystoid edema. And this is his fundus uh, appearance. He did a fluorescein angiogram. Again, you can, it's not very clear why would he have a disc and macular edema while having a, a ruptured aneurysm. The, the, the question, the, uh, the answer of this question is the late angiogram. If you look at the late angiogram, you will see leakage from the vessels, and the evidence of vasculitis, a small hemorrhage that was uh, overlooked, again, is suggestive of vasculitis. So this patient is basically a vasculitis patient because of Bessit, and he had an arthritis of the brain that led to weakened artery lead, lead, led to uh, an aneurysm that has ruptured and caused this uh, intra, uh, cerebral hemorrhage. So uh, once the uh, diagnosis has been made, we, he, he was put on systemic immunosuppression with steroids and cyclosporin. One month later, he reported great improvement of vision to 6.9 and 6.12. This is his OCT then with almost complete resolution of edema. His condition was controlled on steroids and cyclosporin 100 milligrams twice per day. And he kept a follow up for almost three years with, uh, uh, with stability. Um, so in conclusion, what I wanted from this presentation is to highlight the entity neurobesit as a cause of ophthalmic complaint. And that proper management of these conditions can reverse the pathology, allowing rehabilitation of the patients. Uh, and lastly, it's uh, the importance of MRV in all cases even a non basic patient, any patient with uh, intracranial hypertension, MRV can reveal a venous thrombosis, uh, which is managed very differently. Thank you. Are you still with me? Yes. Yes, we are. Okay. Very interesting cases, Dr. Abdelazim. So when you get the patient uh, that you're suspecting uh, basic with uh, uh, other um, system involvement, um, who do you refer the patient first to? Well, I, I have a different way of doing things. Uh, when, whenever a patient 
comes to me and I need a systemic immunosuppression, he has to go first to the rheumatologist and do a full exam, physical exam, everything. All I do is a systemic inquiry. This is, this is all I can do. I used in the past when I was young, I used to do the systemic examination myself. But I, but I found that they, they are better. They're much better than us. Um, and then they would uh, request the investigation they want. And I, I guide them. I just write in the uh, referral letter that I'm suspecting of uh, whatever and I need you. Uh, even I write the treatment that I need and whether this is okay with them or not. So if you find, for instance, they has hepatitis C, for instance, and uh, systemic immunosuppression is not, is not possible, then he would tell me it's not possible. Or uh, as a type in, for instance, can, can, be, can be used and so on. So it's a two-way thing. And, uh, yeah, which is something that we we would like to stress too, that you always communicate with the rheumatologist and, uh, you know, have Especially the... in, in serious cases like, like these. Um, Right, uh, Dr. Therese, do you have any questions? No, thank you. All right, excellent. So uh, next, uh, Dr. Therese, you're, you're going to go next, right? Yeah. Right, go ahead. Uh, can, uh, Dr. Bazin, can you um, allow me okay. to share? Yeah, yeah, can you? Okay. Here you go. Um, so uh, I'm going to childhood UVITIS, and this is UVITIS below uh, the age of 16 years of age. Let's take uh, uh, this little girl, for example, a similar child came to me. Let's presume her name is Fatma, and uh, she's a five-year-old female patient whose mother says she discovered that she had a uh, white pupil of the right eye that uh, was noticed uh, one month earlier, and the patient never had redness or pain uh, or never complained of the eye. Uh, 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 it, it, so this is a patient leukocoria, and uh, this is, uh, occasionally might be the first manifestation of a patient with TVITIS. All the mother had in the review system was that when she was at three years of age, she used to wake up in the morning and limp with one of her legs, and that would happen occasionally. And now all she has is that she has some knee pain with mild swelling uh, in the left leg. Like, uh, this patient had an ASR that was high, she had joint pain, and so she was placed on monthly penicillin because she was thought to have uh, some sort of arthritis due to rheumatoid fever. And whenever you find a child with high ASR and joint problems on penicillin, please uh, discuss with the pediatrician who is placing this child on penicillin uh, to know, uh, get a better feedback of why the patient, the, the doctor is doing this because occasionally these patients are misdiagnosed and they are... Uh, treated with penicillin unnecessary, which is quite a dangerous drug. Um, as for the eye, she was diagnosed to have cataract, and uh, for fair amplyopia, she was uh, already prepared for having cataract surgery. And uh, what, was told, uh, what was told to the mother is that the eye was quiet. Now let's have a look at the eye of this patient. So you have to wait and stop, and you have to take, make a plan. You have to have a look at the eye properly. You have to have look at the previous labs and decide what you'll do next after you've examined the patient and listened to the mother, you have to use the imaging when necessary and you have to communicate with the immunologist in all pediatric uveitis cases. You can do this alone. Looking at the eye, the right eye was 360 vision. Her intraocular pressure was low. It was 10. The fellow eye was doing quite better. It was 0 0.05 with uh, an intraocular pressure of 15. Uh, looking at the eye, we could see that this patient had all the new KPs. Maybe we can't really appreciate them, but she had band keratopathy. She has some opacity in the center. We have uh, almost occlusive pupillae. Uh, and we have a shallow AC in this eye. Uh, the fellow eye seemed to be quite better. And both eyes had uh, peripheral band keratopathy. And this denotes that this has been ongoing for a while. She's been having this inflammation uh, for quite a while. The AC reaction was one plus cells and one plus flare. And the question is, this isn't really serious. So in this setting, do we regard this patient as not being very active or maybe this patient doesn't really have a very uh, aggressive disease? But actually, even in the setting of plus one cells and flare with these findings of chronic complications and a very wide cataract in the right eye, this patient actually has aggressive disease. And I'll explain this as I go on. 
So this patient has anterior chronic uveitis. We don't know if it's just anterior, is it intermediate or is it panuveitis? And again, I can stress more that we have to look at the periphery. Now, uh, this was a study in Netherlands and they uh, were discussing childhood uveitis and they mentioned it would uh, account to up to five to 10% of uveitic patients that they saw mainly anterior followed by intermediate panuveitis and posterior being the least uh, common. Um, fundus examination in this patient was quite difficult, but normally speaking, we would have a proper look at the fundus and uh, we would indent as uh, Dr. Dina and myself have uh, emphasized earlier. And because we couldn't have a proper look at the fundus, we went on doing sonar, ultrasonography, and we found the retina is in place. The patient had uh, vitreous cells in the anterior vitreous, mainly maybe the posterior vitreous was quite uh, clear. We had more labs, and what we found positive was the ANA was quite high. The patient had an angiogenic converting enzyme of 62 and other labs were uh, quite normal. Now, what I want to stress upon is that uh, angiotensin converting enzyme in children is normally high. It doesn't mean that this child has sarcoidosis. So do not haste in diagnosing sarcoidosis in children based on the angiotensin converting enzyme level, unlike uh, adults. Then the immunologist ordered an MRI uh, of the left knee that showed that she had a joint effusion, not just arthralgia. So this is a patient with juvenile idiopathic arthritis. And let's have a look at this study. Uh, interestingly, they uh, classified uh, the causes of uveitis based on the adolescent uh, age and the preschool age group. And the preschool age group mainly had uh, idiopathic and uh, juvenile uh, uh, idiopathic arthritis. Idiopathic meaning no cause for the uveitis and juvenile idiopathic or, or juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. And the red bars stand for the females and the blue bars stand for the males. And they are quite similar in the idiopathic. However, the, the females tend to be higher in the JIA group. For preschool, starting from toxoplasma down to parsthenitis and other causes, as we can see, uh, being less common than the uh, toxoplasma parsthenitis and other causes of infections. JIA uh, is categorized into three types based on the amount, number of joints and the systemic manifestations of the POSI, the poly, and the systemic uh, type. Let's concentrate on the eye because uh, the systemic manifestations are actually the concern of the immunologist, not us. Now, in these patients, they have chronic low-grade anterior non-granulomatous uveitis, usually bilateral, mainly anterior, occasionally intermediate, and sometimes pan -uveitis. The presence of cystoid macular edema and hot disc do not mean that this patient has posterior uveitis. Patients with JIA never have choroidal infiltrates. They don't have retinitis and usually do not have retinal vasculitis either. Have an OCT when uh, necessary and possible because you would find more macular edema than you would appreciate clinically. The worst type or the most aggressive type and the, and the most uh, insidious of them is the uh, oligoarticular type and it is, has the most common uh, cause uh, or accounting to be the most common type that would uh, uh, have uveitis and it occurs in, into 30 to 50% of them, of these patients. It usually occurs, uh, the, the worst type of uveitis is in the younger age group, meaning a child who is four years or less coming to you with juvenile idiopathic arthritis with uveitis usually uh, is, uh, uh, would bear a poor uh, prognosis uh, visually if not properly controlled. The ANA positive uh, patients and those who have already come with the complications that I showed earlier in the eye. Uh, usually would do worse than those with less complications. So we cannot rely on just topical steroids in these patients or even just systemic steroids in these patients. We have to uh, involve the immunologist and we have to add immunosuppressants or biologics as early as possible. There is the other setting of JIE where a patient has been diagnosed by the immunologist and it sends to you to know if he has uveitis or not. So if this patient does not have uveitis the day you see him, you have to have a, 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 a scheme by which you would uh, keep on following up the patient depending upon the type of uh, uveitis. Is it oligo, poly, articular, or systemic? You have to have a rhythm that you would discuss with the parents of these patients. Depending on also if the ANA is positive or negative and uh, depending on the duration, is it high risk, medium risk, low risk, or is it negligible risk? Because each of these would make you have a plan by which you would see the patient and if you need to see the patient by uh, placing the patient under anesthesia and placing them on the sleep lamp to appreciate the inflammation is very important. Do not take it for granted and do not just uh, settle with having a 
uh, examination from the general anesthesia looking at the posterior segments, you have to have a very, very proper look at the anterior segment on the general anesthesia. Again, I would uh, like to stress on what are the risk factors or wh when we see a child with, uh, with these complications, we know that these are very alarming signs. The seclusive pipili, the shallow EC, the hypotony, and the signs of chronicity. As I mentioned, the AC flare of one plus may seem uh, negligible, but actually the presence of AC flare in these children would uh, cause a five-fold increase in the complications uh, intraocularly. Other causes of uh, childhood uveitis include uh, juvenile ankylosing spondylitis, and I'm not going to discuss this any further because I discussed it already earlier, but I just want to mention that inflammatory bowel disease and writers, which is also known as reactive arthritis, is quite infrequent in children. Uh, sarcoidosis behaves quite differently in children than in adults because uh, it usually would affect the anterior segment of the eye and it would come in the form of a chronic granulomatous form. Uh, in adults, sometimes it would come as an acute form and you treat with steroid and the patient remain quiescent for a while. Usually in children, it's uh, chronic. It could occur as early as five years of age. It has a very uh, peculiar uh, triad. It starts with the rashes and fever and the rashes are usually papular with scales. And then the uveitis and the arthritis would follow in. The uveitis is granulomatous, as I mentioned, and the arthritis usually have a foggy uh, 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 inflammation of the joints that is less painful than the juvenile idiopathic arthritis type. CT chest in these children may not be very useful before the age of eight because usually they don't develop the chest manifestations early. The ACE level is high in children anyways, even without sarcoidosis. But if you have a child who has an ACE level of, of which is above 100, depending on the normal uh, of the, the lab you're using. So if the normal is 60 and the patient is 120, you should consider it uh, or any, anywhere further. I'm not, the, the figures I'm saying are not figures that I got from studies. I'm just giving you an idea of what, how we would think of ACE level in children. And the skin lesions actually are even more common in children than in adults. Another, uh, this is a child actually, and this actually breaks all the rules I saw. This child came to me, he was five years old, he had bilateral disc edema. He had a very similar uh, manifestation of neuroretinitis, and he had this peripheral uh, choroidal lesions. And actually, this patient had lung manifestations, and he was so young, and he had uh, he was diagnosed to have sarcoidosis, but because we had an axillary lymph node uh, biopsy that confirmed the diagnosis. And actually, he, he has very aggressive disease, and we, we switched from two different types of biologics, you know, barely keeping him controlled. Uh, Blau disease or Blau syndrome is a type of uh, uh, familiar inflammatory condition that is very similar to uh, sarcoid uh, uveitis, and this is why I placed it here. It is an autosomal dominant condition, meaning that all family members would have this triad. They would have anterior uveitis that is identical to sarcoidosis. They would have joint disease, and they would have skin manifestations. They uh, joint manifestations would show uh, what we call uh, campylodactyly, and it's the buggy appearance of the joints or the botnier sign where you have flexion of the proximal and extension of the distal interphalangeal joints. Look at the family members because usually they have the joint manifestations and there is the gene study for it, which we don't have in Egypt. Her other disease is seen in children, and this is uh, one of the uh, cases that I came across. And usually they come in a very advanced uh, stage because they are neglected uh, or they are undertreated, and they probably would develop CMVs that would cause macular scars, and they have the uh, extensive uh, depigmentation of the fundus. Usually they develop more systemic manifestations than uh, adults, uh, so you could easily diagnose even if you can see the fundus of these patients, uh, you can you can look at the hair of the the children. You could find hair, white hair strands, or you could have small patches of the light if it's in the early uh, stage of the disease. And studies actually have confirmed that children with VKH usually have more complications than adults. Uh, childhood uh, Bachet's disease uh, is seen in males uh, between the age of 10 to 16, and 20% of them would have a family member who has Bachet's disease. The clinical manifestations are quite similar to adults in form of retinitis and occlusive vasculitis with vitritis. This is one of the patients that I came across, and this boy was nine years old, and he, luckily his uncle had a Bechet's disease, and we can see the amount of ischemia that he has in the macula that are very well appreciated by OCI and geography, as would be appreciated as compared to what, we, what was not appreciated by fluorescein and geography. And we can see that the patient has activity in the periphery, and he has also a retinal ischemia. Now back to our patients. You would be asking me, what are we going to do with this young girl, Fatma? How are we going to manage her? And if she was not GIA and was idiopathic, was I going to manage differently? 
Uh, actually, her management was both topical and systemic treatment. And if she had these manifestations and uh, she, uh, she, she was not uh, an autoimmune disease patient, uh, after excluding infectious and masquerades, I would treat the patient very similarly. And the, the question I'm sure all surgeons want to know is when is this girl going to have a cataract surgery? So let me discuss when we, we use topical and when we use systemic in patients who have anterior viitis. Uh, anterior viitis, if a patient has a first acute attack and there are no signs of recurrences and no complications in the eye, we can start with topicals and see how the patient behaves. However, if the patient starts to have recurrent attacks that are very close to each other, especially on stopping or, dec or decreasing the dose of topical steroids, probably we would consider uh, adding in systemic or if the patient is starting to develop complications. If you have insidious chronic low-grade uveitis, and this patient has no complications like in the Fuchs uh, scenario, we'd probably uh, not go on systemics. However, if this patient starts to have complications like my patient that I'm discussing with you, then we would uh, add systemics. Systemics would be used in intermediate, as Dr. Dina mentioned, if we have dense vitritis, macular edema, or visual impairment, especially in the setting of bilaterality and uh, chronicity, and posterior uveitis also would need uh, systemics, and autoimmune disease patients uh, would need systemics. Talking of topical steroids, using eye drops less than three times daily uh, would do better in terms of having less complications of cataracts by 87% compared to four times. But actually, if I cannot control my patient on two times daily uh, without having uh, to increase and the patient is well controlled uh, for a long time, I would probably have to add something with the, uh, system with the topicals. I, I cannot keep a patient on three times daily for a long time. I usually would go two, then try to go once, then try to go day after day. Uh, in children, I'm very concerned about the fluorinated uh, uh, steroid, topical steroids that are on the market. And some people think there are some magic solution to uveitis. Uh, please be reminded that children uh, using uh, defluorinated uh, uh, steroids for a long time, 100% uh, of them are going to develop cataracts within one year. So be very cautious how you use this. And if you can avoid it in children, please avoid it because it really increases the intraocular pressure. As concerning systemic treatment, we take the step lavender approach, steroids, immunosuppressants, and biologics. In steroids, we're concerned about the growth of the patients. So we don't want to use steroids in children more than three months. If you're not controlling your patient uh, after three months of oral steroids, then you have to really add in an immunosuppressant or a biologic. Don't keep a child more than three months on steroids, uh, unless it's going to be an extremely low dose uh, of steroids that will not affect growth. And always keep an eye on the uh, growth curve of the patient with the pediatrician uh, to make sure the patient is not going into stunted growth. Uh, the immunosuppressants in benign idiopathic arthritis, for example, was found, mitrixate was found to be quite effective in uveitis, and 80% of this patient improved within one year. 60% uh, of them discontinued after quiescence, but 50% of them relapsed within one year, and 50 of, of them remained quiescent. However, those patients who continued on mitrixate for three years actually had a longer period of quiescence on discontinuation of the medication. So it was found to be safer for long-term treatment uh, uh, than oral uh, steroids, because usually the parents are very concerned about this medication, and so am I actually, yes, I am very concerned about giving them immunosuppressants, but sometimes if you have to have a long-term treatment using immunosuppressants such as mitrixate with the immunologist, it's safer for the child than using oral steroids for a long time. The dose has to be adjusted with the immunologist, and we have to readjust the dose as the child grows. Biologics are also used in uveitis, and it has been FDA approved. There are two studies. The Sycamore study included GIA patients who failed mitotrixate and actually did well with Humira or adalimumab, and uh, the Adjuvite study that included also idiopathic uveitis children that failed mitotrixate did well on uh, adalimumab. The dose uh, also has to be adjusted, especially if the child is less than 30 kg. And again, we're doing this with the immunologist. We're not doing it on our own. So uh, let's go back to uh, our dear friend here. And then she had mitoprixate was not sufficient to control the inflammation. So Himera was added. And after three months, this child had her cataract surgery. And uh, she, had a very, she did very well after the cataract surgery. And she's had perfect vision. And these are her photos actually two years after the surgery. And this is the fundus exam as compared to previously before the surgery. I would just touch slightly on infectious uveitis in children. 
and the most common is toxoplasma. This is a study again from Netherlands, so really it's not what, probably not exactly what we see in Egypt. Um, be minded also, apart from toxoplasma and viral and toxocara, that there is cat scratch, acute pertinent causes, cytomegalovirus, and rubella. Uh, toxoplasma in children would either be the congenital appearance, which is the typical punched uh, scar that we see in the macula, and usually the eye is amblyopic, always amblyopic, or the acquired form. This is a child who is eight years old and she has this retinitis and she gets treated and this forms into a scar with epiretinal membrane. And uh, the regimen of treatment for children who have uh, toxoplasma is quite different from adults, I mean, in those terms. And so you have to be reminded of the doses that you're going to use. And if the patient is uh, allergic to sulfur or cannot tolerate this medication, you can use azithromycin with the uh, appropriate doses. I want to uh, discuss uh, post streptococcal uveitis because sometimes it's overlooked. Now, a streptococcal infection actually can induce uveitis, and the uveitis would occur within one month of the onset of the systemic disease. The systemic disease could come in form of pharyngitis, or tonsillitis, glomerulonephritis, rheumatic fever, reactive arthritis, or erythemenodosum. And we suspect it when the ocular inflammation occurs within a month, as I mentioned in children between the age of 5 to 16, usually bilateral and usually anterior uveitis. All we have to do is the ASOT test, TITR, uh, which is a very common and cheap test that's all over the place. You have to check the ASR, the CBC, check if this patient has any shifts in the differentials uh, uh, for infection, and the urine keratinine and urine analysis because of the glomerulonephritis. Sometimes the throat swap with culture could uh, detect the uh, streptococcal infection and they respond perfectly to topical steroids with the uh, relevant antibiotics. And sometimes if the uh, tonsillitis is recurrent, tonsillectomy may be useful. So we have to keep it in our mind. Toxocariasis occurs in young children, mainly boys at the age of nine and it's unilateral and you might have a granulomatous lesion uh, with a fibroglial band extending from the disc downward, or uh, you might have a superpolar granulomatous lesion with the band, or might not even have a band, or may come in form of the um, diffused uh, end of end of thalmitis. So, if you have a, a male patient and this patient has a vitritis, and probably sometimes by sonar you can appreciate the band coming from the disc and extending to the periphery, you think of toxoperiasis. So, how would I suspect it? A clinical picture with the positive serology. Now, be very cautious how you deal with the positive serology because 77% of school children you might have a positive serology for toxocariasis. Uh, but if it's negative, then you're sure that this patient uh, probably is not a toxocara patient. Uh, studies have been conducted on the use of ELISA for intraocular fluid of these patients from the eye, but we do not have this in Egypt, so we can't talk about it. Uh, in treatment, uh, the active inflammation, such as active vitritis or active chorioretinitis, would do well with the albendazole, which is the uh, medication for this uh, disease, however, with the oral steroids. However, if the patient is in chronicity, meaning the patient has dense pacifications or has traction, uh, or even in the stage of retinal detachment, usually these medications may not be very useful and the surgery may be useful. And these are two pictures from literature before and uh, after surgery. Uh, uh, TB uveitis in children was studied in North India, and they, they mentioned that they had the same clinical picture as adults, but the inflammatory process was more aggressive, and so they needed a more aggressive uh, steroid treatment than adults. And this is a patient who was, uh, came to me in this uh, trial, actually had cytomegalovirus uh, retinitis, and we diagnosed this by, by a cytomegalovirus uh, anterior ch uh, chamber PCR. It was quite uncommon to see a child with this disease. Actually, this patient was healthy. He, it was a quite a different scenario than the usual. And I wouldn't take time to discuss it, but all I want to say is that whenever a patient comes with cytomegalovirus retinitis and is a child, you think of a, a common variant immunodeficiency disease or primary variant immunodeficiency disease that might be affecting the immune system, and this can be uh, checked for with the infection specialist. Masquerades uh, in pediatric uveitis uh, include acute lymphocytic leukemia. Dr. Dina will cover this uh, next time. Uh, but what I want to discuss is the juvenile xanthogranuloma, which is usually in young children. Uh, it's acute and unilateral, and you have a fleshy iris nodule. It causes spontaneous hyphema, and sometimes the iris looks, uh, uh, they're two, they have different colors than the other eye, which is heterochromia. 
And sometimes you could appreciate a skin nodule that is yellowish and elevated, and you just have to either have a biopsy of the skin nodule or from the AC where you find the uh, uh, foamy histocytes uh, with the stone giant cells, as you can see in this histopathology. This is a three-year-old uh, patient who came to me, and she was thought to have fungal uh, endophthalmitis. And actually, she didn't have any cells of any kind, and actually, she had a retinoblastoma. And my final slide is this child. He is eight years old, and he came to me with this appearance, and also thought to be viitis, but by fluorescein. You can see the heart exudates scattered all through the posterior pole, and some of them are subretinal. And this patient actually had telangiectetic vessels, and this is a child uh, with coat disease. And so in conclusion, uh, children, uh, high, there is a high rate of complications and vision loss in children because basically children cannot express for themselves and probably the parents would know that children can see when uh, the condition has advanced. Uh, watch out for infectious and masquerades. Always, always, always coordinate with the immunologist and always remember that early and aggressive treatment uh, where relevant improves a long-term visual outcome of these patients. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Theresa uh, Kamel for uh, this very nice presentation. Um, I think we have one more presentation. Uh, it's the uh, Harada. I'm not sure whether you still have uh, energy. Uh, Dr. Therese, we have a couple of questions. Uh, uh, how did you get the CMV PCR and CV chamber tab done in Egypt? Where? Uh, and uh, have you ever had a patient where uh, GIA uveitis presenting with recurrent eye redness reported by the mother? I'm sorry, uh, I'm trying to get back to you, people. Yeah, sorry. Can you uh, can you go back again on the question? So, first question: Where where did you do the CM, CMV PCR uh, anterior chamber tap? I did it in the lab. I coordinate with the lab, and they do it for me. There was a drop at a point. It, it's it, it, it's it's quite available because of the uh, organ transplant. Then we had a drop in the cytom virus PCR, then it came back again. There's a point they were sending it out, and uh, uh, now you can have it. I can tell you the name of the lab <laughs> later. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah, so uh, can you answer privately to Dr. Rana Amin? Oh, okay. uh, the other question is, have you ever encountered the JA uveitis present with their current eye redness? Uh, as reported by the mother? Uh, sometimes they would have uh, attacks where they would have red eye, uh, but usually it's, it's, it's chronic. Sometimes, occasionally, but usually it's chronic and they usually have white eye. So it, it usually, it, they depend on us to know the exam, during the examination to know if they're active or not. All right, excellent. Now, without further ado, Dr. Abdelazim will uh, take us through uh, Harada disease. Um, so we're not too late for you guys. Okay. Um, to summarize what's uh, VKH or Vogit Koinagi Harada disease as described by Survey of Ophthalmology in 2017, uh, that it, it is a severe bilateral granulomatous intraocular inflammation associated with serous retinal detachments. Uh, disc edema, vitritis, and eventually development of sunset glow fundus. Uh, this is probably the only uh, disease that has been for sure uh, discovered that uh, the T cells are targeting the melanocytes as the cause of uveitis. Um, it has uh, ocular manifestations that passes through four phases, prodromal, uveitic, convalescent, and recurrent. And extraocular manifestations that accompany that, uh, which is headache, meningis meningismus, hearing loss, polios, and vitiligo. And that VKH can give a good result, visual result if treated promptly. In the first phase, the prodromal phase, it's like a viral uh, illness with uh, headache, meningismus, vertigo, auditory disturbance, and sometimes orbital pain. During the acute uvitic phase, the onset is explosive. It's like sudden onset of bilateral granulomatous uveitis in up to 70% of patients with pockets of subretinal fluid and choroidal thickening, blurring of vision and conjunctival injection, swelling and hyperemia of the optic disc. We should note that vitritis and anterior vitreous reaction and anterior uh, uveitis is not necessary for diagnosis. About 30% of patients will have a quiet anterior chamber and no evidence of uveitis. Just 
uh, serious detachment, multiple serious detachment, detachments, as you can see in this uh, photograph. This is an infas um, OCT showing multiple multiple blisters on the surface of the retina. And here is the uh, granulomatous anterior uveitis that sometimes is seen. Um, in this phase, the intraocular pressure behaves in, in, in a different way than other uveitis. So in more than 50%, you'd have an increased intraocular pressure secondary to ciliary body detachment and swelling that would move forward and displace the iris lens di diaphragm, shallowing the anterior chamber and closing up the angle. And uh, the, uh, here the pressure would respond to steroids rather than anti-glaucoma medication. And uh, very often in, the, in these patients, this is the only presenting sign. The eye is completely quiet, no serious detachment still uh, occurring, just pressure, high pressure, and very shallow anterior chamber. However, sometimes the presenting uh, finding is hypotony. And this is a di di diagram showing how the ciliary body uh, swelling can push the lens uh, iris diaphragm forward, narrowing the, ang the uh, angle. And here is a shallow anterior chamber bilaterally in a young uh, patient. The third phase is the convalescent phase. This usually happens in weeks to months after the acute uvitic phase and is characterized by depigmentation of the choroid, vitiligo, polyoses, uh, occur at this uh, time. Depigmentation of the choroid usually takes two to three months and gives a characteristic sunset uh, glow appearance. And this is a typical appearance with some RPE pigment clumping. The chronic uh, recurrent phase, not all patients reach this phase. Some of the patients, unfortunate patients, reach this uh, phase because this is the, the phase of complications. And unfortunately, inflammation at that point is resistant to systemic steroids. It usually lasts about six to nine months and it's as marked by complications, most notably subretinal fibrosis and CNV. This is a child who has a band-shaped keratopathy and hand movement in both eyes. As Dr. Trace has previously said that harada in children is very often very severe. Extraocular manifestations include neurological findings, which include headache, meningismus, and CSF fluid pleocytosis. And very uncommonly, you can have a focal neurological uh, signs. Um, um, Auditory findings uh, are much more common, it happens about 50% of the patients, tinnitus in about 40%, and these uh, symptoms often respond very well to steroids. Integumentary findings, meaning uh, involvement of uh, skin and uh, nails and uh, hair in the form of depigmentation of the choroid eyebrows, eyelashes, uh, resulting in polyoses in vitiligo. This happens in about 30% of cases. And this is again a child with bilateral polyosis and vitiligo. Um, so in, um, in 2001, uh, American Journal of uh, Ophthalmology has published the uh, criteria where uh, how you, you diagnose uh, VKH. So to diagnose a, a complete VKH, you need to have five points. Uh, number one, no history of penetrating eye injury to exclude sympathetic ophthalmitis. No clinical or lab evidence uh, suggests of other ocular disease that can mimic uh, VKH like sarcoidosis or TB. Bilateral ocular involvement uh, of the eye of either A or B. A is the early manifestations uh, character characterized by diffuse choroiditis, focal areas of subretinal fluid, bullets, retinal detachment. And if equivocal, we need to do at that point fluorescein angiography, giving a characteristic pinpoint leakage early in the angiogram and early choroidal non-perfusion, patches of, of non-perfusion. Uh, or um, if uh, visualization is poor, B-scan would uh, reveal a diffuse choroidal thickening in the absence of, uh, of serious scleritis. Uh, if the patient presents late in the disease, late manifestations, he would give a history suggestive of bilateral, acute, or even sudden loss of vision in both eyes uh, uh, signs of inflammation in the anterior chamber. You can find uh, an ocular depigmentation of sunset, uh, glow, fundus, or segura sign. These are very characteristic of uh, 
of the, the patient had Harada before. Um, uh, uh, number four is the neurological findings, as we've previously uh, described of tinnitus, meningismus, hearing loss, uh, CSF, leucytosis, integumentary findings, which is the pigmentary uh, loss, as in uh, poliosis, vitiligo, alopecia, and nail changes. So to, to diagnose a complete VKH, you need to have all these five criteria. Uh, if one, uh, four or five is missing, you have you can diagnose an incomplete VKH. And you, if you only have one to three, then this is a probable VKH. Uh, this is a fluorescein angiography showing an early pinpoint, early non-perfusion, uh, uh, patchy uh, corroded non-perfusion and early pinpoint hyperfluorescent uh, spots. Again, early hyperfluorescent spots. This is OCT showing a very characteristic serious detachment, marked corridor thickening, wavy RPE, as well as the very characteristic segmentation due to attachment, fibrin attachment of, of, the, of the serious detachment of the retina to some points of the RPE, revealing a tenting-like appearance. This is very characteristic of Harada. So before we diagnose Harada, we need to, dif to differentiate from other mimicking diseases. Uh, if there is a prior uh, trauma, then this is probably sympathetic ophthalmia, infection like syphilis and TB, malignancies, uh, masquerade syndromes, it will be discussed tomorrow, next week with Dr. Adina, and in other inflammatory diseases like bilateral posterior scleritis, sarcoidosis, MP, multiple evanescent white dot syndrome, and lupus choroidopathy. I'm going to present uh, cases that presented uh, not in a typical fashion. So the first case is a 22-year-old female that came with a blurred vision in the left eye uh, in uh, 2014 and was diagnosed at that point as a straightforward central serous uh, chorioretinopathy and was managed conservatively until spontaneous recovery with uh, almost 20-20 uh, vision. Uh, and the right eye at that point was normal. She came back to me in 2017 with recurrence of the blurring of vision in the left eye. I thought it's a left CSR again. It looked like a, a CSR. So I, I ordered fluorescein angiogram and OCT, which looked very different. The, the one on the, the image on the left is the previous, the 2014 image of CSR, typical CSR. But the one on the right with the segmentation it's characteristic of Harada. And then she did a fluorescein angiography. I, I, I wasn't sure at that point what's the relation between CSR and Harada. Is it a coincidence? So, but I noticed few vitreous cells, no, no anterior chamber activity, few vitreous cells, uh, very small, uh, fresh KPs at the back of the cornea. So here I had to reverse the, reverse the diagnosis to Harada which is atypical, but I didn't understand the relation between CSR and, and uh, Harada. Fluorescein angiography showed a, uh, a circular uh, a, a lesion in the periphery, very characteristic of old CSR, peripheral CSR, asymptomatic CSR, again confirming that my first diagnosis was correct. However, centrally, there's the pinpoint hyperfluorescent dots early in the angiogram. Again, confirming that this is this is a change in pathology. So I've started, he, the, the reason why it's important to make the distinction because CSR, it's, in, it's, it's contraindicated to give steroids in CSR. It would make things worse. Whereas in, in uh, Harada, you have to give immunosuppression. So I started immunosuppression with steroids, 20 milligrams and azathioprine, 100 milligrams. And this uh, resulted in an excellent recovery. However, she had an in, uh, idiosyncrasy from the azathioprine with very raised, very high liver enzymes that I had to stop uh, her treatment. She immediately developed a severe relapse. I uh, brought her in, gave her a left, uh, which the eye mostly affected, left orbital floor diprofos, as well as uh, started her on cyclosporin, 200 milligrams, and uh, gave her back uh, 20 milligrams of steroids. 
she again started to recover from this treatment. And this is interesting because uh, the, uh, the first uh, OCT on the left is the before treatment. And after the azathioprine, she was much better. And then when I, once I stopped the treatment, again, the same thing re returned, the serious detachment returned. And when I re uh, controlled the condition with cyclosporin steroids, she maintained uh, recovery. And the left eye, as you can see, the serious detachment is away from the center. And this is why she was not symptomatic in this eye. I tapered her treatment gradually to stop. And she, uh, she wanted to get pregnant at one point. So I, uh, I just maintained steroids uh, during her uh, pregnancy. And that, now she has uh, stopped even the steroids. And for several months, she, she's symptom-free, recurrence-free. The second case is a very interesting uh, uh, child, 15-year-old girl who came in 2017 with a headache for vision, bilateral 0.3 uh, vision, very shallow anterior chamber, cup disc ratio of 0.7 in the right, 0.3 in the left. Uh, however, the eyes completely quiet. Intraocular pressure uh, was 30 and 26 on uh, anti-glucoma medication. Uh, the uh, previous notes of the, of the doctor uh, referred, uh, who referred the patient to me said that he, he did a VEP and ERG, which was subnormal, and for a angiography, which showed changes, but I'm not sure of that. Um, intraocular pressure during my follow-up steadily went up despite adding all maximum anti-glucoma medication and went up to 40s and 50s. So I decided to do a trabeculectomy in the right eye with mitomycin on releasable uh, uh, suture and kept the releasable suture tight uh, to because of the fear of the shallow anterior chamber. Postoperatively, the pressure was 27, and again, the anterior chamber very shallow. However, there was no touch. The suture was released, reducing the pressure a little bit. Again, the anterior chamber very shallow. I did a B scan, which looked pretty normal. Uh, a few months later, the pressure started to rise again to 34 and 28. Um, and then uh, one month later, she came with an acute onset of severe headache, dizziness, loss of vision bilaterally, hand movement, uh, and uh, anterior chamber with plus four cells, vitritis of plus uh, three, BIO score of plus three, inferior oxidative retinal attachment, hyperemia, and the B scan revealed bilateral vitritis with oxidative retinal attachment and diffusely thickened choroid. As you can see, this is the B scan. As you can see, the inferior serious detachment. So I wasn't sure what is happening. Is it the sympathetic ophthalmitis secondary to my right trabeculectomy, or is it Harada from the beginning, presenting with chronic anger closure glaucoma due to ciliary body swelling? Um, I wasn't aware actually of, of the second uh, entity. When I revised the literature, I found several reports of patients presenting solely with anger closure glaucoma, very young patients, uh, which is not common to have an anger closure glaucoma in them, with no uh, otherwise very completely white eyes, only to develop uh, inflammation uh, months later. Um, I, I immediately gave her intravenous methylprednisolone, uh, three doses, with 40 milligrams um, uh, uh, oral steroids later on as a thioprin. She immediately improved to counting fingers. Their chamber deepened for the first time I ever see her, you ever see, uh, seen her. And the intraocular pressure went down to 16 millimeter mercury bilaterally. I shifted her to Humera with excellent control. However, because of unavailability, she stopped the Humera, immediately had a severe relapse with only hand movement and counting fingers. Started her on cyclosporin and intravenous methyl, uh, prednisolone, vision came up to 560 in one eye and hand movement in the other. This is the flat uh, lab on the right and the posterior synechia in the left eye. Um, she later developed uh, subretinal fibrosis and CMV. When she developed the CMV, I gave her anti-VGF. She, after that, developed a severe relapse, which uh, I treated with intravenous methylpred and Humira and orbital floor diprofos. Now the inflammation has settled and has been quiet for uh, 
several months. However, her vision is, is only counting fingers. My last patient is a patient who, who came to me in 2003. He's a male military engineer, uh, 36 years old, who came with the blaring of vision that uh, kept waxing and waning since two months as she with tinnitus and hearing loss. Uh, he gave uh, the, uh, the notes with him. The referral note uh, said that he had panuveitis uh, two months ago and that he was treated with oral steroids. Uh, he, has, uh, he had at that point auditory loss. His steroids uh, uh, was tapered very quickly. On examination, uh, the vision was 6 9 and 6, uh, 6 12 and 6 9, very little anterior chamber activity. Uh, fundus, there was few vitreous cells, otherwise, looked normal. Um, the, uh, the, he only had headache and uh, tinnitus and hearing and some deafness. This is the uh, fundus photograph that he had with him when he came to me with, uh, again, uh, some serous uh, uh, fluid, uh, pockets of fluid around the disc, nothing in the periphery. We're seeing angiogram, again, showing uh, leakage around the disc. However, with pinpoint uh, hyperfluorescent dots, but that appeared very, very late in the angiogram. Nothing in the early angiogram. These are the leaking points. And this is uh, the edema around the disc. This is the close-up. And I did an audiometry to make sure that he had a sensory, we uh, confirmed the sensory auditory loss. Otherwise, he was completely normal. So what's going on? Is it a Harada? Or is it an MP? Or is it multiple evanescent white dot syndrome? So I made a, a table putting all the items in the, in the three uh, categories. And I came out with that this is, this is MP. This is an atypical MP. Um, before that, I didn't know that MP can be associated with serious detachment. Actually, it, it, there, there are several reports of serious detachment happening with, with MP. And uh, the good thing is that it is self-limiting uh, as in our case. This patient presented to me uh, only a few years ago uh, just for a checkup and did a fluorescein angiogram. As you can see, he does not have the sunset glow uh, appearance and he only had some uh, RPE disturbance around the disc with a 6-6 vision in both eyes. So in conclusion, Harada's disease is probably the second most common uveitis in Egypt after uh, uh, basis. Most of the time, the diagnostic criteria is fulfilled and the diagnosis is straightforward. However, sometimes the lack of accompanying inflammation or atypical presentation can pose a challenge. Thank you. Are you still with me? Yeah, we're here. Okay. But uh, so, uh, thank you. Uh, we had a couple of questions uh, from the audience. Uh, I'm going to run through them real quick. Do you start uh, immunomodulatory therapy with steroids from the get-go? Myself? Yes. Yes, I do. And how long I, do you... I know Dr. Trace does this a little bit differently. Uh, uh, but the problem, the, the point is that uh, the immunosuppression takes, most of the immunosuppression takes about a couple of weeks to work, whether cyclosporin or azathioprine. Or like a couple so, of months. So, uh, 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 yeah, what, what's the what's written in literature is about two to three weeks. So, um, so during this period, you need to cover it with steroids, and then you don't need to lose all the the time that you're controlling things with steroids, uh, and then start, you know, immunosuppression later on. So you need to to use the time. So what's the doses? How how do you determine the doses depending on the severity of the disease? I just choose the the doses according how severe the disease I, uh, as I, as I mentioned in the previous, uh, in the last, uh, last Thursday, once, uh, once I, I done, the, I've done, uh, I reached the control. I, I start, I start tapering steroids to 10 milligrams or less, and then start tapering the, the immunosuppression to least possible. Uh, Dr. Trees, do you do it differently? Oh, actually, if I have a patient uh, with a very severe, uh, fluid, already, or we have the immigration of the RPE starting early, uh, or the patient is already starting to develop this very small retinal lesions that start to appear in the periphery, I would go on directly and start uh, immunosuppressants. 
Right, but I do it like Dr. Abdelazim does. I start immunosuppression from the get-go. Although there was a question from the, the audience about the Sunset Glow Fundus. So Sunset Glow Fundus has not been shown to uh, change its course with or without treatment. So Sunset Glow Fundus will ensue. Um, but systemic uh, immunosuppression has been found to uh, correlate with less uh, uh, complications with posterior synechia and cataract because the, the posterior synechia can lead to iris bombay on this on those patients. I don't know if you have experiences, but I've seen them more often present with, you know, like massive bombay that with stony. Yeah, true. Um, all right. We have a, a request from the audience about uh, doing a, a lecture on uh, vitreoretinopathies that uh, mimic uh, UV disease. Um, Dr. Chis, do you have uh, any comment on that? We can plan it in the future. Okay, do you see them often? Like patients who were uh, referred to the UVS clinic, but they're actually yeah. not? Yes, yes we, we, do have, we have a good number. Yeah, I would agree. I just had once uh, a myelidosis that looked very much like a vitreoretinopathy. Otherwise, it's not very common. Interesting. So anyway. yeah. you're like the internist of ophthalmology. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Um, all right. So uh, any more questions or uh, can we wrap up? All right. Things to things to look okay on the chat. Uh, thank you guys for staying with us. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ablazim. Thank you, Dr. Kamel. Uh, I hope to see you all next Thursday, right? 8 p.m. inshallah. All right. Okay, thank, thank you. you all. Okay. Thank, thank you, you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye.